Coming up on Ignition GT, Zipporah drives the eagerly awaited Kia Stinger. The most impressive feature in this car is the ease in which it delivers performance. Mercedes-Benz's electric sub-brand makes its local debut. The EQ brand from Mercedes-Benz is part of our strategy to go to move towards zero emission driving. And we explore Toyota's performance models, past, present and future. The resurrection of the Supra is nearly complete, with the production model poised for release in 2019. Now, South Africans got their first taste of the Kia Stinger at the 2017 Festival of Motoring, but we've had to wait more than a year for the car to become available in South Africa. Zipporah was one of the first who were lucky enough to drive it. What is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the word Stinger? Well, if your line of thought is anything like ours, then bees might be the answer. Because apart from making honey, stinging is what bees are most famously known for. It might seem like a weird connotation for this upmarket halo car, but the stinger has more in common with the humble worker bee than it might seem at first. According to Gregory Gulam, Kia's chief designer, the stinger styling was inspired by the Coca-Cola bottle, and the visual connection is more evident in the profile, with the curvy flanks harking back to the Dodge Chargers of the 1960s and 70s. Incidentally, Dodge offered a limited edition, high-performance derivative of the Charger, dubbed the Super B. The Stinger's distinctive cab rearward silhouette also reminds you of a bee's body, a short, purposeful nose, and a sizable yet shapely rump. The bee possesses five eyes, three simple and two compound, similar to the Stinger's intricate headlamps. And as for the antenna, see this black lens here? That's the camera. There are two more under the wing mirrors and at the back, giving you a 360 degree view of your surroundings, just like a bee's. Finally, there's the abdomen, which in the case of the bee contains not only the internal organs, but also the honey pouch, the very reason for the bee's existence, and also quite an important element of the stinger. In Kia's own words, the stinger is not an art and art performance car with hard edge dynamics and brutal styling. It is intended as a long-distance tourer that doesn't compromise on comfort and luxury. Hence, the GT moniker at the back. The Stinger's grand touring intentions are evident from the moment you climb inside. The cabin is cocooning but not cramped. The seat's comfy yet supportive. The low-slung driving position with the wide center console is reminiscent of GTs of the past like the Jaguar XJS and the Porsche 928 but visibility out of the cabin is surprisingly good, even through the steeply raked rear windscreen. The list of standard equipment in this car is long, very long in fact. You get heated and ventilated front seats, a power tailgate, a power sunroof, heads-up display, wireless smartphone charging, and a 15-speaker Harman Kardon audio system. That's impressive, I hear you say. And so it should be at the Stinger's lofty sticker price of 859,000 Rand 900. For that same price, you can get yourself a BMW 4 Series Grand Coupe or an Audi A5 Sportback. The Kia's closest non premium rival, however, is the Volkswagen Artyan, a car which we love, yet few buyers took any notice of. So, how does the Stinger compare to such revered company? And what sets it apart? Well, to find out, it's time to leave the city and head to this Kia's natural habitat. Elsewhere in the world, the Sting is available with four-cylinder petrol and diesel engines. But South Africa will only get the twin-turbo V6, and that's because here, the car is branded as a limited-run halo model. Let me just say that right off the bat, the Stinger takes on the role of a long-distance tourer so excellently. I mean, it's smooth, it's quiet, and if driven sensibly, it can also be quite fuel efficient. The most impressive feature in this car is the ease in which it delivers performance. I mean, there might be a force-fed power plant underneath the bonnet, but the linear way in which it accelerates is akin to a larger naturally aspirated engine. Nowadays though, we expect cars to fulfill multiple roles. Simply being a consummate mile eater is not enough 
if you're hoping to compete against the likes of BMW and Audi. And this is where the Stinger falls short, in our opinion. Yes, there are five different drive modes, including a track mode. And yes, it's properly fast. Zero to 100 is yours in under five seconds. But you can't help feeling the Stinger was never meant to be hustled too vigorously. The chassis always feels composed, and those massive Brembo brakes reassure you that you'll always be able to come to a halt quickly and securely. So what is it then? I think it is the sound from the exhaust. Um, in a BMW 6 cylinder for instance, once you get pressing on that accelerator, the note hardens and becomes more rough. But in a Kia, it becomes louder and more strained. Frankly, I think it needs a bit more sting in the bag. So does this mean that you should dismiss the Kia Stinger altogether? Well, before you do, there's some factors to consider. Firstly, that it even exists. For Kia to produce a car like this, is akin to Land Rover producing a high volume, low cost city car. It's almost unheard of. Then there's the speed in which the Korean company developed the Stinger. What started out as a GT concept, shown in Frankfurt in 2011, then evolved into a GT4 Stinger displayed in Detroit in 2014. And just four years later, here it is, on the road in South Africa. But there's something else. In an age where cars are becoming increasingly dynamic, refinement and comfort often fall by the wayside. We have frequently commented about the harsh ride quality of Mercedes-Benz products, and they're not even the only culprits. The Stinger, by contrast, provides a cosseting experience for those who sit inside it and a mesmerizing one for those who get to clap their eyes on it. It might not be the new queen bee in its segment, however, it is a super bee in our books. After the break, we turn our attention to something completely different, the EQ brand from Mercedes-Benz. And later on, Brenwin takes a closer look at Toyota's impressive performance car lineage. Mercedes-Benz debuted their first all-electric SUV, the EQC, at the Paris Motor Show earlier this year. Now less than two months later, the EQ brand has been launched here in South Africa. The EQ brand from Mercedes-Benz is part of our strategy to go to move towards zero emission driving. European legislation uh, requires that Mercedes-Benz, like all other manufacturers, complies with very, very strict uh, emission control regulation that's already in force. What they plan to do in time is to expand the range to offer an all-electric version of every model series. So whether it's A in the hatchback segment, uh, an SUV, a large saloon, and so on and so on. Premiering locally was the EQA concept, which is similar in dimensions to the A-Class, but with an electric motor at both the front and rear axles. These electric motors will produce 200 kilowatts and achieve a claimed range of 400 kilometers, depending on how much lead you have in your right foot, of course. Hitting our shores in 2020 is the EQC, all-electric SUV. Using a similar setup to that of the EQA, the C will produce 300 kilowatts of power, while the battery can be charged up to 80% in just 40 minutes. From a brand point of view, um, the electric vehicle from Mercedes-Benz will need to promise and deliver exactly what Mercedes-Benz stands for, luxury, comfort, safety, and most importantly, um, incredible driving experiences. Worldwide electric vehicles are fast transitioning from novelty to necessity, but it remains to be seen if the appetite for EVs will increase amongst local buyers. I think it'll take a while, but acceptance will come, and with a big brand like Mercedes entering the fold, the acceptance will be speeded up.
Further afield, Volkswagen unveiled its all-new T-Cross. Actually, we should rather say wider afield, as the German automaker launched the new small SUV in Amsterdam, Shanghai and Sao Paulo, all on the same day, just a few hours apart. Now, the reasoning behind this multinational debut is twofold. Firstly, the T-Cross will be built in Europe, South America and China. And secondly, because these are the markets where VW hopes that the new baby Bundebasha will make inroads. Utilizing the VW Group's familiar MQB architecture, the T-Cross sports a notably spacious interior despite being just 4 meters long. The boot, for instance, can swallow 385 liters of luggage or 455 liters if you slide the rear seats forward. There is a choice of three petrol engines and a diesel, and all are compliant with the latest Euro 60 temp emissions legislation. And the T-Cross comes standard with a comprehensive list of safety features. Unlike its marginally bigger T-Rock sibling, the T-Cross is destined for our shores, arriving in South Africa in the second half of 2019, with pricing to be announced closer to launch date. The T-Cross will be competing in a market segment that is already jam-packed with competent rivals, like Honda's HRV, which was recently updated and spent some time in the GT garage. What I love about the HRV is just that Japanese Honda solidity. The car feels so great when you get inside, and the layout, the air vents, the dash, everything is exactly where you want it, and that's always been a strength uh, with Honda. It might not be the most exciting selling feature, but the best part about the HRV is its practicality. You have amazing room inside, very spacious in the back, and of course, one does trademark magic seats, which allow you to load tall items into the back behind the driver and the passenger seat. Um, they also fold completely flat, so you have a nice, big, flat cargo area. They have spruced it up a little bit, giving it a bit of chrome touches on the front and the new uh, LED headlights, which are actually quite nice, but overall it's just a little bit bland, to be quite honest. Um, the CVT gear box I actually quite enjoyed. They've stepped it, so it makes it imitate like there's actually gears. For me, the problem is really the engine. Um, if you want to overtake on the open road, it just feels like you really have to wring its neck and not much happens. Infotainment system, not great though. It feels like from a 90s PlayStation game. It's, they really need to up their game on that. The biggest challenge I think for them though is, is pricing. So many cars are being offered in the segment and so many brands have moved into the premium sector that paying 420 for the top spec that we've got just feels a little bit expensive. Don't go away because after the break, we drive the Toyota Yaris GRMN and we take a look at some of its famous predecessors. So overwhelming are its charms that you'd find any reason to get into the saddle. The Toyota brand, synonymous with virtues of dependability, affordability and the ease of ownership that comes with having a dealership on virtually every street corner in South Africa. A consistent purveyor of reliable automotive appliances. If the brand had an account on Tinder, that is what their biography would say. We ought not to forget, however, that a significant part of its makeup is shaded with a truly sporting hue. And in recent years, company CEO Akio Toyoda has intensified efforts in sparking a resurgence of performance-oriented products that pander to those who love to drive. You get the impression that he may have been gifted an anthology of Dr. Seuss books back when he took office in 2009. In many of his public speeches, he is known for being liberal with the word fun and declaring his objective in putting the fun into Toyota products. As a famous hat-wearing cat once asserted, it is fun to have fun, but you have to know how. And the arrival of the Yaris GRMN inspired us to take a glance back in the rearview mirror at some of Toyota's notable hits in this department of fun before some careful consideration of what the little car signifies for future performance wares expected from the brand. 
A good year to start is 1967, with a sleek two-door that not only helped Toyota elevate its stock, but also showed the world that Japan was capable of a lot more than robust but humdrum cars for the masses. Oh yes, the delectable 2000 GT, whose sleek silhouette was inspired by a certain British icon also birthed around that time. But the Toyota was far more exclusive, with just 351 built, and two of those cars had their ceilings chopped off for a role in a film about a British secret agent who found himself in Japan. Of course, seasoned aficionados will point out that the 2000 GT was not, in fact, Toyota's first attempt at such a genre. No, that honor goes to the dainty Sports 800 of 1965. Anyway, onto the 1970s and enter the Celica moniker, which birthed a spin-off in the form of the Supra, which became a standalone model. Then there was the AE86 series, derivatives of the Corolla Levin and Sprinter Truno. At this point, you would want to cue the anime factoids and lyrical waxing from the initial D fanbase. Okay, so those are just a few of the notable highlights in the global context of the Toyota Performance Chronicles. But what about here in South Africa? We need to cite terms such as Sprinter, Twin Cam, RSI, RXI, and indeed TRD. Yes, our market has had consistent exposure to the more exciting side of Toyota over the years. Now allow us to introduce GRMN. GRMN, what is that? The acronym holds a little equity in the eyes of fans, but that could soon change. Kazoo Racing, Masters of Nürburgring. That is what the four letters denote. It's a rather ambitious title and one that will separate the regular wares from the sporting ones in the Toyota lineup. And our first taste of what that experience will bring is in the form of this little car. The Yaris GRMN ends the carmaker's hiatus in the B-segment hot hatchback category. And our biggest criticism against the car is that you can't buy it. Only 400 units were built and three of those made their way to our shores to be used for demonstration purposes only. We were lucky enough to have gotten our paws on a unit for 48 hours and we're doing our very best to make every second count. With its white, red and black colour scheme, the Yaris resembles a clown. Look at its scowling face. This is the character It from the Stephen King novel albeit in vehicular form. And just like how young Georgie was beckoned towards the storm drain, the GRMN summoned me out of bed at the crack of dawn to get a chance to sample its charms. Which has to be the hallmark of a praiseworthy car. So overwhelming are its charms that you'd find any reason to get into the saddle. From standstill, the GRMN is eager to zing all the way to redline, to commit a needle bouncing off the limiter as you snatch second gear. Toyota says you can see 100 kilometers an hour in 6.3 seconds, so it could hold its own from a set of traffic lights against equivalent peers. Spring times aside, this is one of those cars that does not require fine worthy velocities to relay a sense of excitement to its driver. The rev happy, lively nature of this engine coupled with handling characteristics you describe as chuckable, make this car a hoot around Gerotech's dynamic handling circuit. So in conclusion, Toyota has successfully distilled this essence of fun and sprinkled it atop what was previously one of its most dreary models. We might feel that many of their models might be dreary right now, but adorning the walls of the Toyota Museum is a glimpse of some of the more exciting and eulogized members of the Toyota family. This hall would generally be filled with classics, but today it is empty. And not because of our disregard for the past, our adoration for their previous models were well documented earlier in this piece, but because we want to emphasize that the Yaris GRMN marks a return to the performance arena for Toyota. And the Yaris is the first entrant into what will be a fresh-faced lineup of Toyota Halo models. So how long before we see the fruits of all of this? 
Well, it's going to be a bit of a wait, but the wheels are in motion. The resurrection of the Supra is nearly complete, with the production model poised for release in 2019. This joint effort with BMW will mark an interesting chapter in the Toyota story, and consumers can also expect GRMN variations of the forthcoming new Aorus hatchback. The evolution of Gazoo Racing developments in Toyota's passenger car lineup is going to be rather interesting to observe. And so we come to the end of another show, but please do join us again next week when I get behind the wheel of the long-awaited Suzuki Jimny. I cannot wait. Wheelbase of 2.2 meters, making it really, really difficult for you to actually go and beach this thing or get stuck on an obstacle. Brenwin also chats to Aston Martin GM Grant Dryden. It's always been seen as the gentleman supercar, so you can be in a, in a racing suit and you can take it to the track and thrash it around and then still look like a gentleman. And we bring you all the highlights from the 2018 SEMA show. On that model, as you can see, it's, it's the one with the most bare carbon fiber you could see on any Ford GT so far. But until next time, please buckle up, don't text and drive, and stay alive. Uh.